So we're in um, Exodus 12, verse 43 uh, through to 13, 16. And um, if you're here this Sunday, but not last, you just kind of missed the Passover and, uh, and everything that's happening. And, and we've still got just a few kind of uh, uh, end parts of this. Because here in the Exodus, we have the first major climax of the book, of which there are a few still to come. This is the moment when God brought about the very last plague uh, of judgment upon Egypt, isn't it? And as he did that, he also brought about the time for Israel's deliverance from slavery. And it was at this precise moment when he was about to bring down judgment upon Egypt uh, that God uh, brought about Passover, or the Passover. What was this? It was... It was essentially a meal. It was to be held in, in households, and it had a sacrificial lamb at the heart of it. And if you remember, this lamb was very much a sign. We, we had some doorposts here and a lintel, didn't we? And we were painting blood on it last week. And just as a reminder of the fact that as they, as they put the blood on the lintel on the doorposts, Passover gets his name from the fact that God was going to pass over the households that were under the blood and they were not going to face the judgment uh, that fell upon Egypt. And so from then on, Passover was going to recall every year how God redeemed his people from slavery in Egypt. God wasn't going to let this just pass and be forgotten. No, he wanted his people to have a feast day, uh, a day when they would remember every year what it was that God had done to deliver uh, their forebears, their, their ancients, as it were, from uh, slavery in Egypt. Now, earlier, God had warned Pharaoh of what was to come, that it would be the death of the firstborn in all the households of Egypt, and even as cattle too, we've read about that, and how God had prepared his people with instructions for their deliverance. And if you weren't here last Sunday, I'd encourage you to, to, to listen to last Sunday's message so that, you, uh, so that your understanding of Passover is secure, because it, it very much points towards uh, what the Lord Jesus was going to do on the cross. Now in chapter 12, verses 1 through 10, 28, uh, were the instructions for the Israelites about how they should keep Passover. And this included the time, the place, how the lamb should be chosen, how it should be kept, how it should then be killed, how they were to daub the blood on the doorposts, on the lintel, how the meal was be to be prepared with bitter herbs in it to signify the bitterness of slavery in Egypt that they were being delivered, for, delivered from. Uh, there was uh, some instructions about how it was to be eaten. They were to eat it with their boots on, their belt on, their coat on, their staff in their hand, ready to leave, because that very night, before dusk, uh, before dawn, sorry, uh, you know, dusk, uh, uh, the Jewish day runs uh, dusk through to the following day, so it's kind of night then day, and so as dusk fell, that's when they were to remember Passover. Judgment fell at midnight, didn't it? By the time dawn comes, they're on their way, you know, literally right then the following morning. And um, so God had given instructions about how they should keep the Passover. Uh, why? Because chapter 12, verse 12, this is what God was going to do. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on this night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. But they're going to keep Passover because this blood is going to be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, verse 13, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So we've, we read there the, the instructions about how they should keep the Passover and uh, and, and those events which God has foretold, he brings about, and uh, we've read that in verses 29 uh, through to 36 of chapter 12. Well, why were they to keep the Passover? It was essentially so that they could retell the story every year of 
redemption. This is how God redeemed us. This is how God brought us near as his people. And, uh, and so chapter 12, verses 24 to 27, if you look at that, you know, you shall observe this and uh, for, with your sons forever. And when your son, when you come into the land and your sons ask you, what is this? You're going to be able to tell them the story of redemption, you see. Well, now we come to the last part of chapter 12. So if he's spoken of how they should keep the Passover, he's spoken of why they should keep the Passover, now he's speaking about who should keep the Passover. And you might say to me, Pastor Murray, this is, this is all very interesting, but I'm not an Old Testament Jew. Why do I need to know about who should keep the Passover? Is this relevant to me? Well, it is, because if you remember, all these things that took place back then in the Exodus... Maybe not everything was part of it, but they are types, aren't they? They're, they're a pattern of redemption. They're a pattern of how God is going to save people. The, the, the lamb was a, a, a type of Christ. Christ is our Passover. The blood on the, on the lintel on the doors is essentially the blood of the cross. You know, he, he wounded in his head, wounded in his hand, wounded in his feet. But if you're in Christ, then you're going to be safe. The Lord is going to pass over you, isn't he, in his judgment. And so uh, as we think about the types that are here, through this passage we learn three things this morning. So three things to pick out here about what it means to be redeemed. So God is bringing about redemption here. He's rescuing a people from their sins. And in this passage here this morning from 1243 through to 1316, there's three things that we can learn about what it means to be redeemed. Firstly, to be redeemed means to be brought near and into relationship with God. We, were, we are by nature far off. We are by nature distanced from God. Our sins have separated us from God. Uh, but... The, 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 in redemption, we are brought near. How, now, how does this play out here in this passage? When God brought about the Passover, we, we notice here that it was an observance, an ordinance, a feast day to be repeated annually in order to retell the story of God's people. And at uh, chapter 12, verse 42, uh, that last part concludes, it is a night of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. That, that, this is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generations. This as it took place was to be remembered. It was to be repeated almost, you know, as they had that meal together in their households. And it was to be remembered for all generations because of what the Lord did for his people. And uh, so you have a word there uh, in my Bible, it's translated ordinance. You might have regulation perhaps in yours or a statute or something like that. There's different ways that word can be uh, translated in verse 43. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. These are the regulations and how uh, uh, you will keep it. And by this, he is speaking of who should keep it. Notice he says um, straight away, um, uh, a, uh, every man's servant, well, straight away, sorry, on verse 43, no outsider shall eat it. If you, if you were to, uh, who is it that was entitled to mark Passover? Well, not the stranger, not the outsider, not the alien, as it were. Uh, it's, it was designed for God's people. This is the people that God had brought near. No outsider is for the people of God. Uh, someone whose servant was permanent. So we've got a difference here between a kind of daily hired servant and a permanent servant. Those who's, who have permanent servants in their households, well, they can eat it provided they were circumcised. They had to come under the covenant. They had, this was the sign of them becoming one of God's, uh, in, the, in the household, as it were. It was to be eaten in one house, not taken from house to house. This was a, a family occasion. This was to be done uh, in the household 
uh, where they gathered for the meal. We're told all of Israel, all God's people should keep it. This is for God's people, wasn't it? And every one of them should mark it. If a stranger or a foreigner wanted to keep the feast, he could, but only if he was circumcised, is what he says here. So that he is one with the people of God, and there's one regulation, one order that fits all. The order is, is essentially this, if you're circumcised, therefore become part of God's people. That was the, the practice that they did. That was the sign in their flesh of being a member of God's covenant people, then yes, they may eat it. Otherwise, outsiders must not. And so these regulations show that those who shared in the Passover meal were the people whom God was bringing near, who had people whom God had brought near, and who were now in relationship with him. And these things relate in some way to how we remember and observe the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Remember, you know, those uh, acrostic for Baptist churches, B-A-P-T-I-S-T, you know, believer, uh, ba biblical authority, autonomy of the local church, priesthood of believers, and so on. The, there's, we believe in two church ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Two things that the Lord set down that we follow, uh, uh, we observe as a pattern. Well, uh, Christ, didn't he, had... A Passover meal with the disciples, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, and he took elements uh, of that Passover meal and he showed, didn't he, how this Passover meal looked back to the redemption of Israel. But now, as he ate and as he drank that meal with the disciples, he invested some elements of that with, with new meaning, didn't he? He, he was saying, Actually, those things pointed to what I'm about to do here on the cross. That the blood of the Lamb there points to the blood of the Lamb of God, the Son of God, who's going to give his life on the cross. That the covenant that the people of God were brought into uh, there in the Old Testament, the Lord Jesus is going to bring about the new covenant, a new relationship with God's people. And he was going to do that by... Uh, fulfilling, as it were, the pattern of the Old Testament uh, laid down there by his suffering, death, and resurrection. And he's left us with a simpler, but nevertheless, a memorial meal. What is it that, that we do? We proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We, we keep it in remembrance of him, don't we? And it's not, it's not such a complicated meal. It's not even kind of done in the family home, it's done in the, in, the, in the family of God, in the church family, because the family of God is no longer those who are by birthright, as it were, we're descendants of Abraham, descendants that, you know, we can trace our lineage. No, we become, uh, as it were, sons of God by faith and come into the new family, the, the church family, don't we? God's family by faith. And so, just like the Passover, the Lord's Supper, here we see, is for those who are God's people. In the Old Testament, God's people became so by birth. They traced their Jewish descent. Each, each, each young boy who knew of his Jewish descent was circumcised on the eighth day to show that they were a member of God's household, that they'd come under the covenant, that they were, as it were, marked out and separated to God as the people of God. But for us, our entrance into the family is by faith, isn't it? We're born again by God's Spirit. And it's not bloodline, but faith which determines whether we are God's people or not. Keep your finger there. But by all means, turn to uh, John chapter 1. Speaking of the Word, the Word which was coming flesh, the Word from the beginning, uh, it says in, in verse 10, we could pick it up. He was in the world. The world was made through him. The world did not know him. Speaking of Christ, he came to his own. His own didn't receive him. So he came to his own place, his own people. The Jewish people did not receive him, did they? And therefore, just like the generation that, that was going to die out in the wilderness and not go in and inherit the promised land, there's a, there was a people that Jesus came to because they didn't receive him. We're not going to enter into 
the, the economy, the new households of God, the kingdom of God. Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, so they're not descendants of Abraham, nor of the will of the flesh, but of the, nor of the will of man, but of God. The people of God are the people that God is choosing and who is calling through the gospel and who are saved by faith, you see. And so back then, you know, in our, in our passage back here about the Passover, it was only the circumcised who were to eat it. Circumcision was this sign that they were a member of God's household, a people set apart to God, a people who were, uh, by the v virtue of the very sign, cut off from the fleshly desires of the world. That's kind of what it symbolized. In the New Testament, we're told, aren't we, that true circumcision is of the heart. Keep your finger there again, but you can turn with me to Romans chapter 2 and verse 29. We could pick it up in verse 28. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now, God, now he's not redefining here who the Jewish nation is, but he's defining here that God's people as a nation weren't really God's people if they didn't have genuine faith. They could be circumcised in the flesh, but if, if their desire and their heart wasn't different, then not all Israel is Israel, is it? But those of us who are not Jews, but who are circumcised, as it were, in the heart, in the spirit, by the spirit, that when you believe in Christ, when you're saved, when you're born again, the spirit comes in and changes your desires... And, and whereas once you live for sin, you know, you just, you, you said jump and you said how high and you're quite happy to party and be drunk and take drugs if that was your thing or, or there was no restraint as it were. But now in Christ, you realize that you've got to turn away from that. You repent of all that and that you need to live a holy life and you want to live for the Lord. That circumcision is in the spirit. It's not about the letter. It, it's about the spirit, isn't it? And whose praise is not from men, but from God, is a, is a play on the, the term uh, Judaios, which means praised of God. I won't go into that. But when we're saved then, or born again, the inward transformation by the Spirit seals us and sets us to, apart to God as a son and as a member of the body of Christ. And through the Spirit, we're delivered from the power of inward sin. Again, Keep your finger there, but by all means turn to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11. Colossians 2 verse 11 says this, In him you were also circumcised. So this is in Christ. In Christ you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now he's not, saying, he's not saying here because Christ was circumcised that somehow that which took place to him when he was eight years old has benefited you. He's contrasting the circumcision of Christ with the circumcision of the law and of Moses. But he's saying here that we, God's people, have been circumcised, not done by hands, but because the Spirit has done that, has changed our hearts, changed our desires, changed us inwardly. And that is the circumcision of Christ. That is, you know, the circumcision of Moses was chip-chop. And, and you become, as it were, a member, a, a, the sign of you're a member of the household of God. Did it really change the heart? No. Did it, did it cause the people of God to live faithfully to God, to keep the covenant, to, to worship God and not worship these, or to, to keep from adultery? Or to, it didn't do that, did it? But the circumcision of Christ, which is by the Spirit in the heart, does change that. Now, we're not made perfect, but we're being set apart to God. We're sanctified to God, you see. We've been brought near. And so, um, 
this is this is the uh, this is the sign, as it were, that we have been brought near, isn't it? Uh, if we were to connect this with baptism in the New Testament, we demonstrate the, the inward change outwardly by our baptism. Why do we get baptized? That's because we say, I've been saved. Praise the Lord. I've been forgiven. I've been given new life. And as a consequence of that, we, uh, we, we go through the waters of baptism to say, I died with Christ and I was buried with him and I've been raised with him to newness of life. And we outwardly demonstrate, so there is still an outward demonstrate, but of what has happened inwardly as we've become a member of God's household. And as a result of that, we then eat and we drink together. We have communion together as God's people, don't we? Though we are from various families and various places all around the world. You know, if we were to write down everywhere where we've all come from in here around the world, it would be, a, a, you know, all over, wouldn't it? And yet we're one family in Christ. We're one body under his headship. We're one in Christ, one in his body, one in communion. And, uh, and together we eat. You see, we are one bread in the Lord, one bread, one body. And this is why the Lord's Supper isn't to be taken lightly or thoughtlessly. It is clearly for believers to remember our salvation and the redemption we have in Christ, just as they marked Passover and looked back to their redemption. So we observe the Lord's Supper, and it speaks of our redemption. If you haven't been redeemed, then what you're participating in doesn't really make sense, does it, you see? So it tells us, Uh, here who can eat the Passover and that tells us through that that this is the people that God has brought near the redeemed are people that God has brought near now let's read on into chapter 13 we're going to run out of time here in chapter 13 the Lord then tells them when this Passover meal was to be remembered and it's associated with this feast of unleavened bread this period of seven days uh, of unleavened bread He says in verse 3, I'm going to come back to verses 1 and 2 in a minute, but in verse 3, Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which he went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. On the day that you are going out, uh, on this day you are going out in the month of Abib. Uh, Sometimes the same month is referred to as Nisan or, or Abib. Um, but it's the same month. So Passover was located in this period of seven days of a feast known as unleavened bread. And leaven, if you know, is yeast. So a normal bread, you work the yeast into the dough, and as you bake it, it will rise, won't it? And that is a normal leavened bread. But an unleavened bread has no yeast in it and is essentially a flat bread. It doesn't rise. And when they went out by haste here, they had no time, did they, to kind of work the yeast into the bread. They just had to kind of, you know, take the stuff with them and their kneading bowls on their backs and head straight out. And so uh, this unleavened bread, look at this rain, we don't need this next week, um, but this unleavened bread was the bread that they ate there in that first week as they headed out uh, uh, towards the promised land. And so uh, the Lord wanted them to mark that, to uh, have this as as part of their remembrance, didn't he? Now, in preparation for this, note in verse 7, they were to purge their homes of any leaven during the feast. And we watched this, didn't we, on the, on the film the other day, uh, Samantha, there was a, there was a little uh, hour-long program about how the Jews still mark the Passover feast and the, the cedar meal that they call it, S-E-D-E-R, to this day. And, and, you know, they hide bits of kind of breadcrumbs around the house and the children have got to go around the house and they've got to hunt out the leaven and, and get rid of it. It's got to be burnt, it's got to be chucked out in the rubbish or, or whatever, you see, so that their house is free of leaven. And leaven is often a symbol for sin. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. You permit sin, and then the whole lump is going to be uh, leavened, isn't it? It doesn't always uh, uh, associate with sin, but typically it, it does. Now, keep your finger there, but I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 
Paul is having to rebuke and correct the church at Corinth because of all of their sexual sins and wrongdoings. And he says in chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, well, he says your glorying is not good. You, don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump, verse 6. Verse 7, therefore purge out the old leaven. The old leaven is your old sins, your old lifestyle, that you may be a new lump since you are truly, so, sorry, since you truly are unleavened. He's saying, you, having been saved from sin, are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us, i.e. to redeem us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread or attitudes or lifestyle of sincerity and truth. Oops, lost my page there. And what he's saying here is that just as the Jews were redeemed from Egypt and thereafter prepared themselves and their households to mark Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread by purging their homes of leaven, he's saying for us in Christ, the true Passover, having been redeemed from sin, we have in effect become unleavened. Do you see that there? He says... He says, since you truly are unleavened, you have been saved from sin. Therefore, you've, you've gone from being, as it were, leavened bread to unleavened bread. You are now pure, uh, as it were, without sin. Uh, you've been saved from it. And so this tells us that to be redeemed means we are to no longer live for sin, but for righteousness. If we've been redeemed from sin and therefore become unleavened, we must never go back to the old sinful ways. Don't mark the feast in a leavened way. Don't, you, can't, you can't meet together as God's people uh, and gather around as a church, uh, glorying in the fact that one of you is sleeping with, your, with, your, with a stepmother, which is the kind of thing that's going on, uh, but glorying in your divisions. Well, I'm with Peter and I'm with Apollos and I'm with... Um, so no, you can't. That is all wrong, you see. And he's saying that you've got, you've got to mark the feast without all of that old leavened nature and attitudes, but with the unleavened attitude of honesty, purity, and truth. Now, back there in that, in that verse in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 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 chapter 5, verse 7, this word that's translated sincerity, it might be translated slightly differently in yours, it's, it's an interesting word, aile crinea. The aile bit is related to heli, which is the word sun in Greek. And the crini bit means judgment. And the idea is here that, you know, imagine if you took a glass of water, um, you could take a glass of water, and if you held it up to the light, you would see whether it's pure or whether it's cloudy, you see. And so something, this word translated sincere, means it, it's something which is examined in the light. As the light shines through it, you can see if it's pure, transparent, honest, clear, you see. Otherwise, the light shows it's dirty, it's mucky, it's cloudy, you see. And so he's saying, we, we now that we've been unleavened, as it were, our, our, our lives are to be lived in the, in the sunlight, S-O-N light, the light of God's word, the light of the truth, as it were. And that tests our, our walk with him. And so before him, we are to live in sincerity, in clarity, in purity, in truth. It, it, we're to judge ourselves, you see. That's the idea. And so, you know, this is, it, Paul picks that up in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when he speaks about meeting together and, and, and the Lord's Supper. He says, let a man examine himself and so let him eat. Hold, hold your life up to the, to the light and, and examine yourself. Is it cloudy? Have you got, is there sin in your life that needs, to be, that needs to be repented of? 
because you've become unleavened and you don't want to go back to being leavened again, you see. It's a, it's a dangerous place to be. And if you fail to do so, fail to examine yourself and accommodate sinful desire and action and attitude and so on, then it puts us in danger of the Lord's discipline. He says, if you don't judge yourselves, then the Lord might judge you. And that's why some of you are weak and asleep and some have died. You know, that's what he says there in that passage, doesn't he? So there's some correspondence here between the preparation for the Passover meal and our own preparation for the ordinance of the Lord's Supper as we come to that. To be redeemed then means we've been rescued from slavery to sin. We've been brought near to God. We're reconciled and in relationship with him. But it's that we might live as God's unleavened people, as his pure people, as his righteous people, as his holy people, a people examined by the light of of God's word, God's finger, as it were, God's sight, and uh, doing as much as we can to live purely for him uh, and, and, and walking away from all of those sinful desires that, that, that are there. The Lord has given us his, this, his spirit that we might overcome some of those fleshly desires, hasn't he? Thirdly here, to finish, to be redeemed means we have a new master. We are the Lord's possession. So chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, begins a thought that is then picked up in verses 11 through 16. Verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and animal, it is mine. And then he picks up, further on, verses 11 and onwards, about what they are to do when they come into the land, how they are uh, to, uh, uh, verse, verse 12, set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is every firstling that comes from an animal, which you have, the males, they should be the Lord's. But every firstling of a donkey is to be redeemed with a lamb. And if you won't redeem it, then it's forfeit. It should, you shall break its neck. And the firstborn of man among your sons, well, obviously you can't you know, uh, sacrifice them. They've got to be redeemed, haven't they? And so from this point onwards, from this time of redemption onwards, the first thing of the flock, all the males, were to be the Lord's. If it was uh, applied to a donkey, it should be redeemed with a lamb. If it was applied to a son, the son was to be redeemed. Why was this? Well, in practical terms, again, it's so that they can tell the story. Verses 14, 15, 16. When your son says, why do you do this? It's so that you can say, well, by, by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out. He brought judgment down on all the Egyptians and all of their firstborns of sons and flocks died out. But the Lord protected us. So they can tell the story in practical terms, can't they? But the principle behind this was this. When the last judgment fell upon Egypt, God protected his people from judgment through the blood of the Passover lamb. And the fact that the judgment fell upon Egypt's firstborn sons and cattle, but not among Israel, meant they were the Lord's. They were his possession, you see. They should have died. Their lives were kind of forfeited to the Lord. He had a claim upon them because in any normal circumstances, they would die. Or well, they would have died, wouldn't they? And so he's kind of putting in place a repetition of these things uh, to show that in a special way that uh, the, the, the Lord is bringing his people near to him and that they are his, you see. He had a claim upon their lives. If the animal born, you know, if you're a sheep herd or a goat herd or whatever, and you've got all the flocks and there's a first, firstling of the flock is a male, well, that's a, a clean animal. It should just be offered up to the Lord. That's going to be, it's going to give birth plenty more times. Uh, give that first to the, to the Lord. If it was of an unclean animal like a horse or an ass or a donkey or, or, or something like that, then it should be redeemed or its life was forfeit. But if it was a son... It, it, it needed to be redeemed because it was unclean. It couldn't be offered to the Lord. Something had to be in its place. And a son, 
The fact that it needs to be redeemed shows that our life is forfeit, as it were. It shows that we can't be offered. You see, we need to be redeemed. We need to be redeemed by the blood of a lamb. Now, Hebrews 12, 23 said, shed some light on this. So um, we're probably not going to go back there into Exodus now. We're probably in Hebrews. See if you can find Hebrews and chapter 12 and verse 23. And we'll come to this just by reminding ourselves of where this is in, in the book of Hebrews. So in chapter 11, the writer has run through all the characters of the Old Testament who lived by faith, who persevered against all the odds that they faced. And he comes to chapter 12 and verse 1 and describes them as a cloud of witnesses. Therefore we also since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. These, the faithful of old, as it were, are, are in the arena. They're around us. Their lives have been written there in scriptures. They call us to live that same faithful life that they live. They're a cloud of witnesses, calling us to lay aside the sins and weights that would hinder our progress, to fix our eyes upon Jesus and run the race before us. And he goes on to explain in chapter 12 how the present sufferings and hardships that God's people feel are evidence of God's fatherly discipline and love towards us. The Lord chastens those whom he loves and treats us like a son. So he's, he's speaking, isn't he, to, to believers who are facing difficulties, hardships, persecutions. He's saying, remember all the faithful of old. They're, they're like a big crowd that, that urges us to go on. And we have to singularly keep our eye fixed, focus on the Lord Jesus. We have to lay aside every weight, every sin, and every hardship that, that, will, that will hinder us in that progress. And even if we are facing uh, affliction and suffering and hardship, it's a sign of God's love that God is at work in your life because you're a son to shape you and conform you to the image of his son. It's just what a father would do for his, his own son whom he loves, you see. And then he goes on to say that as God's people, we haven't come to a mountain like Sinai that can be touched. touched. We're going to come to that eventually in Exodus, but all of those as they came out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, and through the wilderness, eventually came to, to, to Sinai. And there at Sinai, they could touch the mountain, only they weren't allowed to. There was a, you know, they, they could, the, the mountain quaked, the Lord came down upon it in fire, but it was a very earthly thing. It was something that could be touched, you see. But we, we haven't come to a mountain that can be touched, verse 18, but we have come to the true mountain, Zion in heaven. We come uh, uh, the, the earthly mountain just pictured the heavenly mountain, that, that as it were, uh, the throne of God is there, of which the, the earthly representation of it we find it a few times in Sinai, there in the desert, uh, and, uh, and also in the temple, you know, when, when God's throne is there, or God's presence with the, uh, through the tabernacle there in the wilderness. But, but the real temple, the real presence of God is there in heaven. Moses is told to make the tabernacle after the fashion of what he saw in the, in, the, in the heavens, you see. So this is the real, but the real can't be touched. The real is held on, hold on to by faith, you see. The real we, we don't see, but we see by eyes of faith. But that is the true mountain in heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem. And all who live in it are, are there. So he says, you come, verse 22, to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, uh, and the blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. Now, there's there stacks in that. We haven't got time to go into all of that. But notice God's people are described as the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Now, of course, the first, way of, the first primary way of understanding this is that the church belongs to Christ, who is the firstborn, isn't he? We, we know he's given that title, 
the first, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He came into this world that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So the church belongs to Christ who is the firstborn, but there's more to it than that. We belong to Christ who is the firstborn because we are also the church of the firstborn. The church is comprised of all who are of the firstborn, who share in him because we were redeemed by him. So to put it this way, back in the Old Testament, all the firstborn sons had to be redeemed. And, and that's it, that, 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 because, as it were, they were, they were the Lord's. You know, they, they were redeemed to, to be the Lord's. They're mine, says the Lord. And in the same way, the church are all people who are redeemed. We're the church of the firstborn. Does it, you see, there's, there, there's more to it than just possessed by the firstborn. We also are in him, being members of him in one body, one with him. He's the, he's the head, we're the body. We're all in the firstborn. And we're all, in a sense, firstborn sons in him. Yeah? It's, it's kind of complicated, but that's, that's what it's in. And I'm sure about this because this is how Matthew Henry takes it in his, in his explanation of this. And it was like, oh, I'd never thought about it quite like that. But sometimes you do need to just think about it in slightly different terms, doesn't it? So let's track that back. We deserve to die, didn't we? Just as all the firstborn of Egypt did. But through the death of Christ, God's own firstborn... We have been redeemed, haven't we, by the blood of the cross that speaks better things than Abel's right here. And this makes the church mine, says the Lord. You belong to me. I've purchased you. you you've been bought with a price. You are mine, you see. We have a new owner. We have a new master. We once were slaves to sin, and through sin and desire, the, the owner was the devil, wasn't he? he? He said, jump, and we just followed suit. But now we're owned by the Lord. Where we were once slaves to sin, now we're to be slaves to righteousness because the Lord is holy. Be ye holy, for I, the Lord, am holy, you see. And so what it means to be redeemed then, as we bring all these things together, is to be brought near and into relationship with God, to be rescued from slavery to sin, that we might be set apart to God under new ownership, as it were, as his sons and heirs. So all of, all of that is kind of pregnant there in the, in the Old Testament, in the pattern, in the regulations of the Passover. And, and the New Testament, is, it teases out and shows how these things are real for us in Christ. Now the question is, for you and for me, do you have a relationship with God? Do, do you know that you know him? Do you know that you know the Lord? Because if you don't know whether you know the Lord, then, then you're still distant from him. And we are by nature distant from him. We come into this world not knowing God, not desiring God, not really caring about the things of God. But as we hear the gospel, we are awakened to the needs of our soul. We're awakened to the fact that actually what I need most in life isn't things, isn't really even experiences, isn't possessions, isn't a good job, isn't necessarily even good health. It is that I might know the Lord, that, that, that he is everything. And the gospel calls us to know the Lord. When we, are, when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died there on the cross for us, that, that our sins might be passed over, that's when we are brought into this new relationship with God through his Son. If you look into your life and, you, you, and you, you, you examine it and you hold it up to the light and, and feel that you're still enslaved by sin. Now, I'm not saying that every Christian lives a perfect life. The Lord isn't expecting perfection in this life, but he's expecting sanctification. He's expecting and he's at work in our lives to, set, to consecrate us to him, to, to, to be changing our lives so that as we look back, we can, we can see how we have made spiritual pilgrims progress, as it were, and, and that we are growing in the likeness of Christ. And that, that through the Spirit and through God's help, we are overcoming some of those sins of the flesh. He's delivered us from the penalty of it, hasn't he? 
he, through his spirit, he is, he is delivering us from the power of sin. And so uh, we need to, uh, we need to, uh, we need to ask ourselves, do I, do I still feel enslaved to sin? If I still feel enslaved to sin, then I need to be redeemed. I need to come to the Lord Jesus, don't I? I need to come and believe in him and be saved by him and be brought near and, and realize that he's called me to live a holy life, to live a, a sanctified, a sin, in sincerity, in purity and truth is how Paul summarizes it. If you're still in that trouble, you need the lamb. You need the Lord. You need what God has provided there for you which in the Old Testament was by this Passover lamb, but, but, but all of that pointed towards the Lord Jesus, who is the lamb of God who bears away the sins of the world as he went to the cross. Of course, if you know you have believed, if you know you are redeemed, well, then don't doubt that you're in relationship with God. You are in relationship with God. The, the fact that you may face some sufferings and hardships and afflictions in this life, that, that doesn't tell you you're not in relationship with God. That, in fact, that tells you that the Lord is at work in your life that he is treating you as a son because he's your father and fathers chasten their sons and they shape them to, to, that they might be more like, uh, like, like himself, like, like, uh, like Christ, you see. We've been conformed to his image, aren't we? God is at work in our life through those afflictions. And by his spirit, if we're God's people and through those circumstances, God is at work to purge us of the old leaven of those old ways that you and me might live the unleavened life, as it were, of righteousness, sincerity, purity, and truth, that you might be his, and that that new name that he's placed on your forehead, as it were, that mark as, as he sealed you out to, to his, as his own, mine, says the Lord, that we might live in accord with that new name, that new nature that the Lord has given us. This is what it means to be redeemed. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, let's finish there this morning. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word to us. There's perhaps quite a lot of complicated things in here. Maybe we haven't pieced it all together in our minds quite rightly yet. But loving Father, nevertheless, we thank you that you have done what you've done in the past, recorded what you've recorded there, patterned your people of old to follow certain regulations and feast days and things like that as it all points towards what you would one day do for us in Christ. Thank you that in Jesus we can be brought near. Thank you that in Jesus uh, we have been brought uh, and delivered from sin that we might live uh, not just in relationship with you but in a, in a righteous life, loving Father. Uh, uh, please, we pray for your Spirit's help to live that right life, Lord, every day as we walk with you. We thank you, Father, that you have set your name uh, upon our foreheads, as it were, that you have called us to be your own. Mine, says the Lord, and that we, uh, uh, as it were, it, uh, needed to be redeemed, and we have been in Christ your Son. Now, as it were, our old lives are forfeit. Our lives is to be lived for a new master, uh, uh, as servants of righteousness. And so we pray, Father, for your grace and help in this uh, every day as we live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.